sign, uh, Danny and Preston, they're going to tell you dark side decentralization. And if you listen up and you ask them secret questions, then uh, maybe uh, they can get all your uh, money back from Celsius uh, and uh, Voyagers and some other type of uh, protocols. Just joking. All right. But um, hey, thanks for coming out. We got some uh, green shoots today, of course. Let's ho hopefully um, continue that trend. But uh, Mo called me a, a couple days ago and said, hey, I got some friends that uh, came over and we can really uh, break down, obviously, uh, best practices for uh, security. Everybody knows, you know, uh, not your keys, not your crypto. But then he started talking about Oh, screw low right. Then he started talking about, hey, listen, um, we can talk about that. We can talk about security. And we can also talk about the nitty gritty of all these huge uh, DeFi hacks and uh, all these like foreign state actors and uh, what they're doing. I was going, that sounds like a um, Tom Clancy type deal. And uh, so we can go that way. But in addition, they've got a whole like PowerPoint presentation. We don't have a, uh, we don't have a, a projector, but what he said next time, he'll do like a little hologram projector, okay? So we got uh, Mosan, uh, co-founder of Ledger Ops, known him for over a long, long, long time. If you're looking for a white hacker, he's the guy. Uh, we got Preston uh, Halborn, and uh, head of security there, and also before it was uh, Coinbase. If you got all different type of uh, customer service issues, feel free to call him. I'm just joking, man, you better run, okay? And we got Danny, uh, Danny's, um, Founder of uh, Virus Bay, is that right? So he's doing uh, um, like a nonprofit consortium for malware. Yep. Okay. So take it away, guys. And Mo is the guy who wrote the, uh, the National Enquirer headline. All right, the dark side decentralization. So get started, guys. Thank you for the. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. We're good. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I've been here for about two years now. Uh, got a lot of love for Puerto Rico and for the community here. I feel like, um, you know, I, I'm honored to be able to finally give back to the community here. Um, I've learned so much from everyone here, and, and I hope that uh, this talk offers a ton of value. Just a little bit about by myself. Um, I started out uh, as a hacker for the DOD, and, you know, kind of across my career, I moved across different agencies. So uh, a lot of three-letter stuff or and doing a lot of three-letter three letter things. And um, eventually I pivoted into the commercial space, um, into the public sector and, and private space, um, basically breaking into computers uh, and telling you know how you did it um, and what you need to do to fix it. That's where I met Preston. Um, we, we worked together uh, for almost 10 years on and off. So, yeah, quite some time. So. Um, and then along that journey, I also met Danny, um, and we've done, you know, probably about seven or eight cons, yeah, different, the world. Yeah, yeah, just travel Love the world travel. and speak at different cons. So, um, coming from the web to security space, we're really excited about off, you know, providing our insight into web three. Um, uh, there's a lot more to, to, you know, security than just, uh, smart contracts. So, a uh, little bit, Preston, if you want to talk about yourself a little bit here. Hey guys. Uh, yeah, so wow, that's so funny to hear it echo. Um, so my background is basically just breaking into things. Um, got started with Mo at, at a team, and we were breaking into the Federal Reserve, et cetera. And then from there, uh, we co-founded, or I co-founded with Mo uh, Ledger Ops, um, which is a lot of fun. And then I ended up working with Coinbase, uh, doing offensive security for, for their you know, red teaming and things of that nature. Uh, I now work at Halburn as a security advisor, so working with a lot of the L1s and working through the entire tech stack of securing, you know, from A to Z. Um, so that's my background. Yeah, so I'm Danny. So I live in San Francisco for now. Um, I come from the side of actually building stuff, not breaking stuff, until I met those two. And then I got into breaking stuff, which was, like, really cool. Um, so I come more from, like, the, I'm the CTO of a fintech startup, non, like, uh, not related to crypto, just, like, TradFi. Um, but I just look at a lot of the things that happened in crypto space and compare them to like how, how we secured things in the traditional finance, um, which is like you, like you said, there's like Web3, Web2, but Web3 still leans on Web2 infrastructure. Um, yeah, so that's about me. Yeah. So, you know, I think a common misconception with Web3 security is everyone's focused on, you know, Web3 security when 
it's still built on top of Web 2. A lot of the infrastructure is built on top of Web 2. So, you know, when we started this uh, researching this talk, we ended up forking into like four different talks, and we decided on this one um, just because we feel like it's going to offer a lot more insight into, you know, the underbelly of the uh, of the cybersecurity world. So. What we're going to discuss today is we're going to go over a little bit over the Harmony hack and the um, the Ronin bridge, yep. and we're going to discuss who was responsible for those attacks. Um, and you know, there's a APT group called Lazarus. Um, they are a North Korean group, and a, if, for anyone that doesn't know what an APT is, it's an advanced persistent threat. They're government um, sponsored, state sponsored attackers. Um, they have typically on APT's uh, purpose is to actually have uh, most most APT's objective is to actually go after state secrets. Um, you know whether it's blueprints of next gen um, military weapons or state secrets. But in this case, um, there's a, f a, f a faction of the Lazarus Group that is focused on financial crimes, and in the past they've gone after traditional. Uh, the financial sector, and now they've pivoted into crypto. So um, an advanced persistent threat is basically a government-sponsored uh, hacker, hacking team, and they have, in theory, infinite resources and infinite amount of time to achieve their objective. So this is who we're currently up against. Um, and that's, you know, an APT um, is different from a traditional hacker group because they're well trained and and you know sponsored by you know the powers that be that have that objective to come after you so um danny you want to tell us a little bit about the lazarus group yeah so actually the lazarus group they started uh hacking or trying to hack crypto or mostly like users of crypto and exchanges i think it was 20 Around 2018, there were about three three hacks attributed to Lazarus. Uh, I gave a talk about that at a conference in Japan. If anyone's interested, it's called uh, Code Blue. Um, so they were attacking like exchanges, traditional infrastructure, not doing anything related to like smart contracts, which is what we actually see here. Um, but inside Lazarus, they're sponsored by well, they're, they're basically North Korean military. Um, they have a couple of subgroups. Um, one of them called Andariel, they're the ones that are focused on bringing money for the regime. So they, there is a few famous hacks they did. I mean, they do some political things as well, like the Sony hack, when they, there was the movie, The Interview, uh, that, was, that was mocking like the, um, their president, so they did that. And there was the Bank of Bangladesh, so they hacked them and like most said, they're persistent. So they're not in a rush to do anything. They will hack, they will sit inside a bank for six months to a year learning how everything operates in order to, when they do want to get money out, they'll do it like slowly so no one like sees it, which is a lot. Of, they actually, they took like a fraction of what they took from the Ronin Bridge. Uh, Ronin Bridge is like just grab and go, where usually they sit and they try to do something because banks are very, very highly monitored. You know, so like every penny that gets out they know that it's missing, so they have to take a long time to do it. Um, so they know how to do this stuff. They know how financial infrastructure works. Um, I got to say, this time, it was a lot easier for them. It was a pretty easy job um, when we look at it. So uh, who here has ever done like a phishing training exercise of like, don't click this link? Only like one person? <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we're doomed. Um, so the funny thing about phishing is that most people, when they talk about how to not get phished, does, anyone, does everyone know what phishing is? Maybe that would have been a better question. Also okay. spear phishing. Spear, like tomato, tomato. Right. Um, okay, so the premise is, is like, what happens if you trick someone into doing a thing that they don't realize what they're doing, right? And um, the funny thing is when most people talk about phishing, it's more in the context of a FedEx package like, hey, check this, you know, the location of your, of your deliverable sort of thing. Um, no real bad guys do that, just so you know. Like, that, like that, that's not how this game works. Um, so in the case of Axie Infinity, it was actually pretty clever. And what the team ended up doing, the team being the bad guys, uh, Lazarus, uh, they actually put together a fake job opening. And they enticed senior engineers on the Axie team 
to uh, essentially apply for this particular position, right? And in doing so, you build, uh, you build a report with this team, with the interviewers, um, you build trust base, et cetera, et cetera. And along the way, let's say that you wanted, like, let's say that you really wanted this job offer, and the way that it works is typically you send out this, you know, generous compensation package of sorts. Um, and embedded within that compensation package was actually a backdoor PDF. Um, upon opening that, uh, upon opening the, it's weird. Yeah, I think it's like a little. Yeah, um, upon opening the PDF, it's uh, it's actually like a backdoor to where you have code execution on the server. And so from there, it becomes this interesting little game of gymnastics around a network, which is typical Web2 stuff. And in the Web2 world, uh, you know, the, the security layers are much, we, as we'll go into, uh, a little bit better than in the Web3 world. And um, so if you take a multi-sig, right, and the Axie Infinity Bridge is a five of nine, or that's the way it was designed, which means that it would require five successful signatures to be able to move funds. Um, unfortunately for them, uh, in breaching the base infrastructure, you're able to grab four of the signatures via the keys were exposed. They were able to pull them from servers. And the fifth one actually piggybacked off of a, there was like an auto gas sort of service that had been enabled to minimize network fees. So in reality, what actually happened is someone opened a malicious PDF, they had code execution, and they had access to all five signatures that they needed. It's actually quite trivial. Um, in the Web2 world, that would not be satisfactory. That would never happen. Like that, this would pass no sample test. No security team would ever allow that to happen. Um, so that's kind of the state of affairs with the Axie bridge. Uh, when it comes to, do you guys want to do the, the harmony? So in essence, the Lazarus group, their ultimate smooth love potion, and they, they ninja the deal, right? Pretty much. And then what, so what you're saying is like, when they were dealing with like Bangladesh Bank or Sony, um, they these bigger organizations have been out for a long time, so they've got white hat hackers to make sure there's redundancies and fail safes. And then uh, obviously Axie, they blew up, and then they wanted to do their own L1, wanted to do their own bridge, and uh, they grew a little too fast. But who 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 did all the audits for them? I mean, so what the hell happened it, there? It's it's, it's more there than no audits. Yeah, but it, but it's Zero. not even an audit. Like an audit wouldn't help. Basically, like if we're looking at their smart contract, they didn't even touch that, right? We're just talking pure hacking their servers, getting the keys to the wallets, and signing them. Um, in a bank, you just wouldn't be able to do it. It's, we're not even talking about white hat hackers that the bank hires. We're talking about the defense team of the bank that has the monitoring all over. Of so so when you guys when you guys talk to a L1 or a bridge or whatever have you. And you're showing, hey, what happened to Ronan? So you're trying to um, um, institute new SOPs within the organization. Does that make sense? Is that what you're saying? Of all the actors and all the programmers, you know, what can they click on? What, you know, all, all these things, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just simple SOPs. You're saying it's not even, it was just a dumb mistake. Yeah, so what, so for starters, um, what happened with, you know, the attack was that it was not a web three attack. It was a web two attack. And there's a false sense of security in the web three world because they're focusing on just a very small part of the attack surface. But when you're vulnerable, um, from, you know, fundamentally you're, you're vulnerable, then it's just a house of cards. Everything's going to come down. So, you know, if you're in any industry, um, whether that's, you know, financials or healthcare, there's all different, types of guidelines um, that you have to follow, their requirements, right? Um, in the Web3 world, that doesn't exist. So there's no, and I hate to say regulation, um, but there, there, that doesn't exist in the Web3 world. So everyone's kind of just doing their own thing, thinking that because it's Web3, it's secure. But when it's built on um, a fragile uh, foundation, then it doesn't matter at all whatsoever. So my, here's a question I have. So what you're saying is uh, the Ronin hack, um, that information is disseminated everywhere. Everybody can go and access it. So when you're talking to new bridges or new L1s and you're talking to security, you ask them about Ronin and you ask them, hey, are they instituting this, uh, these SOPs down the line? What are you hearing from these guys? The standards in this industry are really, really scary. Very scary. Non-existent. 
We're talking like basic monitoring, Jerry, like lack of basic monitoring. Like how long did it take them to find out that the funds were gone? A week. A week, yeah. yeah. Like a bank, it'll be like <laughs> seconds, right? There's a, a, like alerts, there's like red lights going off. So, yeah. So are there going to be services? I, I assume, I assume like... Um, I'm from Tennessee, okay? So there's got to be some, there's small banks that got to use like correspondent banks. They have to use like security firms that's, you know, in New York or, you know, Charlotte, North Carolina or San Francisco. And then they attach onto them. And then that security service is looking at all the, you know, right. the different type of transactions that's um, siphoning money out. Is there somebody doing that for Bridges and L1s to try to give them alerts? From, from like so it doesn't take a damn week? What were I talking about? Actually, we were talking about this today. Like, I was actually thinking the exact same question. Like, why is no one, is there anyone providing, like, There's, security operation center yeah. with, like, a SOC as a service for these guys? Right. Um, There's zero telemetry in, in yeah. this industry. So, you know, if, if you don't have an idea of what assets you own and you, you don't know uh, what's happening on those assets, you know, when, when you have some, uh, uh, an exploit, where the majority of your funds are removed, then it takes you five or six days to even realize that it happened. And it happened to be users that notified them. That's a, that's a big problem. That's a huge problem. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that thinking that something is decentralized, right? Let's say there's a thousand node operators around the world running those nodes. If they're not professionals, it's much easier to hack a thousand nodes that are not secured by professionals than hacking one server that is secured by professionals. Like much easier because they're all running the same software. It's all the same validator software. You find one vulnerability in that those, it can be a million servers. It's the same thing. It doesn't matter, right? You just need that one vulnerability because they're all basically the same. Yeah, especially with, with vulns and node infrastructure, et cetera. Yeah. Um, one of the things that Microsoft does really well is there's this phrase of assume breach, mm -hmm. right? Which uh, people don't really like to assume that they're hacked. Um, I'm confident that I'm always owned. We talk about it almost daily. Of That's just kind of the assumptions you have to make. Um, and if you take security and you apply like this idea of an onion to it, right? And you have this, you have every single layer of the onion serves as a layer of defense. Um, the part that scares me about Web3 in general is that devs don't really necessarily always think about all of the things that could happen, and nor could they, right? It's not their job. They're really great at coding. Um, but the problem is, is in the case of Axie, in the case of Harmony, in the case of the fish, like the phishing attempts that we'll talk about shortly, about like Uniswap that just happened, um, etc. These are like really simple things. And in the Web two world, there are like there are fifty different ways to catch something like that happening. In the Web three world, you've traded the security of an entire team who knows what they're doing to an individual who just buys and trades JPEGs of, of monkeys, right? Uh, it's terrifying, to be honest with you. It's, it's um, you know, not, not that I'm, a, I'm not a big fan of regulation, but you're currently in a state right now of the infancy of this beautiful, prospering ecosystem, and there's zero guidelines, um, there's no compliance uh, requirements, there's no best practices of how to secure your infrastructure. Um, there's no separation of duties, right? You have one person that has, or you have like four or five people that all have the kings to the castle, right? Like in the traditional um, Web2 world, there's, there's roles and, you know, even if you had like admin or root privileges, you would have to only you'd have two separate accounts, right? You'd have one for your day-to-day -day functionality and then one for, you know, um, when you need to use elevated privileges to operate. In this space, you know, everyone's sharing, you know, highly, highly sensitive um, information and roles uh, without the proper safeguards in, in place. So, you know, there's a lack of least privileges. Um, there's... It's, it's, it's basically the Wild West right now. Um, and there's, there needs to be more done besides smart contract audits. Because once the smart contracts become secure, the next thing they're going to do is go after your people, right? 
that's that's it's just easier. a natural path. Yeah, way it's easier. easier. Going after Web two is a lot easier than going after a smart contract. I mean, if I was on their on like from their perspective, I'm like why would I even try to like find a vulnerability in a smart contract? Something that's like no one even you know it's it's like a new industry where you can just grab your tools, open source tools from GitHub that you know all the white hat hackers use. Just spray them, try to find a fish. Uh, a bunch of servers that are running like vulnerable software and like don't have the basic best practices of security. It's a lot easier. I mean, is that what went down for a uh, Harmony and Wormhole? Yeah, I mean, the Har the, yeah, the Harmony hack. They basically so we we didn't want to go too too much in depth in it because there there isn't an official report of the like a so CrowdStrike. Um, I think they 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 helped Ronin with the incident response and uh, um, one of those companies helped. Um, Harmony as well, but there isn't an official report of exactly what happened. But from what's been said and what's been reported from the team, it seems like uh, two servers were hacked uh, because they had open SSH ports or something. Like again, basic things that me as a CTO of a fintech company, I cannot have that because it would not like there are standards that I have to comply with, right? So those are like the basic um, computer information, such like Sys one, Sys two level standards. Uh, if anyone's interested in looking into that, that they didn't have. Um, and that hot wallets there, they were doubly encrypted, um, which that's what we read, but we kind of, like one encryption is enough if, if, if everything is good, like you don't need to double encrypt something. Um, but the thing about encryption is it can be encrypted on the server, but if your server is hacked, like I said before, those are advanced persistent threats. They will be patient and they will wait until you decrypt it or you open the wallet and then they'll sign it and do whatever they want. So they're not in a rush. Like they're, they'll sit there for two years if they need to. So you're saying the Ronin hack, they disclosed everything, but the Harmony hack, they haven't disclosed exactly what went down? So the inv investigation is ongoing. The, the forensic side is still ongoing. Um, so we can... We can make, we don't want to just go off of assumptions. We, we want to work with facts. But, you know, we've, we've been breaking into Fortune 500s and government entities for so long. It's not like they're doing anything new. Typically, once you get your foothold, you start pivoting, right? You start looking for, and you have, your time is on your side. You, you, can, you can sit there as long as you want, as long as you need. It's your job. For, yeah, you they're, just wait. They're literally in the military. And they're just sit, they'll sit there and get their salary until they get the money that they need. That's it. I mean, that's literally the role of this group that has a building in North Korea. They get treated very well. They're like, they're the, they're, they're the heroes of their country because they bring money for the regime. So they have all the resources and they have all the time in the world. Um, and just from these two, just to put it in perspective, their own hack was about, they stole, I think, it's about 20 times more money than they stole from the Bank of Bangladesh, right? Like, in where they were in the Bank of Bangladesh, it was like an eight month operation. And here was, well, like less than a month, probably the whole, including like interviewing the, the guy on LinkedIn and everything. And so. just to kind of uh, hammer home on, on this, the Lazarus group is not a sophisticated group. They're a third tier. Yeah, they're APT. like, they're like, kind of on the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to the degree of sophistication that they're leveraging in their, in their you know, attacks. So the top tier, what are we talking about? Like Russian or Chinese uh, or? Uh, well, well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a, the country that we're there from and the country where I'm from. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, um, you, you take the United States, Israel, uh, UK, okay. you can probably call them like tier one. Uh, tier one, you see them do operations on like critical infrastructure, right? On like big industrial things, uh, nuclear enrichment facilities, things that are way, way, way more complex, right? The, the tier ones aren't interested in money. Right. They're, right, right. they're interested in, you know, state secrets and also, you know, preparing themselves for in the event that there is a, a, a war or even for deterrence, right? right. You, like you shut can, down the grid. Right. Like that right. type of stuff. That's like, right. that's uh, for, tier one. Stuxnet, for example. Yeah. Perfect example of, you know, a tier one APT attack where they had uh, eight zero days. They were able to compromise a air gap facility that was underground. There was 
many, many, many yeah, like layers. Boots on the ground, we're talking like espionage. Someone had to get like a USB stick into like a facility in a hostile country. Those operations are like a whole different level. Yeah. Okay, so getting back on the crypto side, uh, what, was the, what was the next thing you wanted to talk about? So I think we, did, we already did Harmony? Yeah, yeah, I think it was the improvements. Yeah, uh, so Harmony, Harmony, basically, we just, there was a phishing attack, they got a foothold, and then they stole SSH keys. Um, OpenSea, that attack was basically, they, and, and you know, you have to take this into consideration when, you, when you're sitting there and put, putting like a two million or five dollar or five million dollar NFT up for for display, you're basically putting a giant bullseye on your back. So you have to take that into consideration. So with OpenSea, it was very simple response discrepancy. They went to the site and they can enumerate valid accounts. Then they created a phishing email and just fired it off, and then the rest is history. So it's super easy. We do that all the time in Web too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we basically we think about it this way. The, not your keys, not your wallet. Well, if you hold, if you actually do self custody and it's your wallet, then it's your responsibility to protect that like a bank protects the money that's in the vault, right? So there's two sides of this coin. Yeah. Yeah. And, and basically, so what, what's the best practice for if you're holding like expensive JPEGs? I, I got a friend in New Zealand, he's got a lot of blue chips. So what he does is that. He took those blue chips, took it off on another ledger, took it on another MetaMask, and just parked it in the safe. He's not even looking at right. it, not 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 doing any transactions at all with those, um, um, yeah, with those accounts at all. That's all that, I can think. That of. that would probably that's one best practice. Yep. I don't know. Again, depends how much it's worth. I mean, I would think at one point I would put it in a safe in some bank in Switzerland and insure it. <laughs> you know, just not like. I personally wouldn't want to have the, the responsibility of securing that, even though I'm from the industry of like security, right? We're humans. We can make mistakes. I mean, get it insured and get professionals handling it. That's, that's my best, the best advice I can give it. But that's, again, you, very depends where you are, right? Yeah, it depends with your comfort level of, uh, in tech, right? Um, the, right now, your best defense is education, right? Be able to spot the fish. Know how to to distinguish uh, a legitimate email versus a uh, a phishing email. Um, you know when and a lot of these uh, attacks are happening over Twitter, Telegram, Discord. Um, you know you have to be able to spot the fish. You you know understand that in the Web three world, we've basically traded the security model of having a full defensive team to to one individual, and that's you, right? So I'm all for self-custody. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a proponent of being a sovereign individual, but I also know how to detect those types of attacks. So if you're going to do, if you're going to have full custody of your, of your crypto, then do put in that time to research how to protect yourself, um, about what you need to do to help protect yourself. So, you know, that's, that's, you know, one of the biggest takeaways. Yeah. Um, and basic, basic, even just basic computer security, right? Get your browser always up to date, have your antivirus. Like your comp I know a lot of people think that because they're using Apple and they have like Macs that they don't need antiviruses. Um, I'm sorry, but that's not true. There's a, a lot of malware for Mac. Uh, it's just not as famous as like, um, as Windows malware. So just have all the basic things like, you know, get those like, how to secure your computer 101, always have everything up to date. Uh, like Mo said, malicious link, like weird links, weird emails. Uh, we really hope that there'll be some great tools to help with that, to detect like phishing and stuff like that. So, um, so the tools are coming. Um, I, I put together basically, um, I've got, a, I've, I've written some, like a proof of concept right now. It's an API that you can basically take any type of um, address whether it's a contract address or a wallet address. Um, and for example, let's say it's a smart contract, you, you pop in that address and it'll look for malicious behavior based on heuristics. Um, also, you know, how old is this co smart contract? Um, is it coming from a known entity? Who's interacted with it? How many transactions are there? Is the contract sending everything over to Tornado Cash? Like stuff that I do when I look at 
a smart contract. So I've created that API, um, and you know I want to, I will like offer that to the community for free, um, and hopefully someone will come and build, you know, the client side security of it on top of that, um, you know, together, you know, with a combination of tools and education on how these types of attacks work, we can definitely make things a lot more difficult for. for so when you're going to release that, would that be with Ledger Ops or? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, if anyone wants access to it now, I can, I'm more than happy, just reach out to me. Uh, I'll point you in the right direction. It's, it's not, uh, right now in its current state, you need to be somewhat tech savvy. Um, you, as of right now, you, you're basically doing, you know, you're, you're using curl to do a get request. But if somebody, you know, it, it would be rather trivial just to put like a little form on there and a submit button. Um, I, I'm more focused on creating you know, more IOCs uh, or more rules for, for it to make I, it I more I can create that form for you. There we go. Yeah, we, we can do make that. Make it easy for us, guys. Yeah, we'll, we we'll, we'll probably do it tonight. It's not going to take much time. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and basically the, the way it works is it just monitors everything on chain. So, um, and eventually I have ideas of how to expand upon that and make it a lot more robust. Um, but, you know, perhaps that'll be for the next talk. You guys for, want to take questions? Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say for end users, right? Um, I would treat the internet like it's a really evil place because it actually legitimately is. Um, anytime you interact with a DAP, assume that it's trying to steal from you because there's a 30% chance that it actually is. Um, if you have things that are really valuable, I wouldn't use that wallet for like degen things. That's a terrible idea. Uh, you should store those funds on, on alternative like addresses, right? Um, another thing is the approval function. You want to make sure, like, um, what is it, rec.cash is to, to revoke, I believe. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not granting these unlimited spend privileges to, you know, to dApps as you use them. Make sure that it's just like house cleaning, like clean up, clean up the approvals. Especially if it's a mature wallet, because like a year, a year, two, three years ago, most of these dApps were, had like an unlimited approval, like, so, and a lot of people did it. I gotta say, I, I probably did it like three years ago as well. And like, I went to clean that back up. So especially if you're using wallets that you've been using for a long time in, in DeFi and like the NFT space, go over those, uh, your approval function, like who you approved uh, to spend your funds. It's easy to revoke access. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another thing would be, um, I know that this is like level one out of a hundred, but please for the love of God be using hardware wallets. Like, if you're using hot wallets, you're literally just asking to be stolen from. Um, I don't say that as a joke or like to like nitpick on people, but it's so trivially easy to be compromised in the space. If someone finds that, like, if you're posting things online, uh, I think a lot of the space kind of forgets of what you're literally advertising, kind of like what Mosan was saying. You're, you're literally advertising what you own. Um, keep that in mind, right? <laughs> like, that makes you really, really uh, beautiful to an attacker. And they have nothing better to do than to say hello, right? And uh, believe it or not, it's probably easier to find you than you may think. If you take the Uniswap hack, right? Or like the fish, right? It's all just airdrops, right? They, they will target you. They will create unique campaigns that meet your needs. Um, so assume, just assume that there are really bad people that are trying to screw you over. Yeah, I said before spear phishing because spear phishing is, is, phishing is usually like a more general, let's say all users of OpenSea. Spear phishing is like a targeted attack against specific individuals. So the emails are crafted especially towards you. Like they know who you are, they know what you do, uh, and they follow, they follow and they've been following you for a bit. And uh, one more thing is that if you don't trust yourself with a hardware wallet, honestly, put your money like at a reputable exchange. Don't let, and just one thing is don't let, a hardware wallet doesn't make you bulletproof. You, if you sign a malicious contract with a hardware wallet, you're just as well owned. It doesn't matter. Um, so, a hardware wallet is step one, but understand the you know opsec side of of it as well. Another thing is like uh, we. This is more for like a future talk, but as far as like attack channels via Discord, etc. Um, people on Discord may not be your friends, and they may not even be the person that you think that you're talking to using like Unicode encoding and things like that. Like, there's so many ways to trick people that that don't live in this space, um, that you really just have to be careful. Like even, you know, people are using like outdated browsers with hot wallets. Like, come on, like it's, it's like trivial stuff. Um, yeah. 
the, the majority of standard Web 2 you know, best practices for how to, as a user, still applies to Web 3. You know, the majority of it. So it's, we, like to th we like to think of it as common sense security. And there's um, a lot more tooling to help you out in, in the Web 2 world than in the Web 3 world. As of now, I mean, hopefully that will change and there will be a lot more tools. Might also be worth noting uh, that just because you see a link and it looks like the site, uh, like last night we were up pretty late, just for giggles of searching and you may end up seeing some of this stuff in research papers in the future, but there are very similar domains that look the same. So just be careful. Yeah, especially with the I and L and like capital I, it's a very easy trick. Uh, and there's this thing called uh, type squatting or were these different, like an O with like the two dots above it um, from like different languages. So it looks like exactly the same, but something is like, it's been known and let's say a big bank, they would buy their own domains mm -hmm. with these letters just so attackers wouldn't be able to buy it. And we've been looking at available domains last night up pretty late for a bunch of pretty common protocols and we, no one has been buying them. Yeah, so. we almost maxed out the credit card last <laughs> yeah. night. Um, you know, an, an organization will have some sort of threat intel. They have a, a team that is constantly looking for, you know, certain um, suspicious behavior. Right now, you can go and register very, very similar or doppelganger type domains of all of your favorite protocols. For like $9. For like $9. So that tells me that the bad guys aren't even here yet. They're not even here yet. We're, we're, we're in the early phases of being attacked. Like this, is, this is actually like the, the calm before the storm. So now, They're also even advertising on, on your favorite search engine, Google. So they're actually first sometimes. Yeah, so that's Uniswaps. Too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Uniswaps.io is actually number one when you search Uniswap on on Google. They, it's actually a paid advertisement. Yeah, and it's a phishing site. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times what I heard before, just from friends, especially on FOMO Mint days, you got to go back to the original site, the original Twitter account, and you got to go through those links. Otherwise, and you can do all these things. I'm telling you, you're still gonna get you're still gonna get whacked. <laughs> okay. You just do it long enough. Anybody got questions? Got questions? Yes, yes sir. I'll pass it to you afterwards, or come over here. Um, what do you guys think about like social recovery and some of the things that like Argent and other wallets are bringing in uh, to help people be a little more friendly than? maybe cold wallet or shoving things in a lockbox somewhere. Are you familiar with like social recovery and other things like that? You're done in your head. Yeah, so social recovery is really interesting. I'm not familiar with what Argent's doing with it, um, but the premise of, of dividing the trust over multiple sources to which you have a trust is a really interesting, uh, like it, it makes total sense, right? I could easily see that becoming a thing. I know Coinbase is rolling out or they have rolled out a thing of where they basically serve as a partner with you um, of course, I would argue that there may be, there's always strings attached to something like that, but, um, but yeah, social proofs and things of that nature make total sense to me. So if you have minimal technical background, but you're interested in the space, how do you go down the rabbit hole? How do you get started? What are the, you know, baby steps that we could all take if we wanted to learn more both on a business track and a little bit on a technical track? So uh, that's a great question. Um, there's plenty of services that, that exist that teach you basically how to spot phishing attacks. Um, that pretty much applies for the most part to what you would see in the Web3 world. Granted that, that the attack vectors are slightly different, but it puts it at least gives you like the, the mindset that you want to adopt, right? You want to have that uh, critical mindset of of analyzing, you know, question everything. Question everything, one hundred percent. There, <laughs> there's actually a company waiting to be built to do a lot of these things that you're referring to. Um, I don't have a great answer for you. As sad as that you is, you might see three founders here. What's up? I said there might be three founders of a company yeah. here, so I don't know. It, it, um, there's a huge need for it. Yeah, I would say like start with the web too. Get the web, the regular security, com regular computer security stuff in check. Your everything updated, browser, 
uh, antivirus, and then yeah, start Web two has so much more resources that are so mature on basically like personal security on the internet. I would just start out with that, and a lot of because a lot of it basically applies to Web three. End of day. Yeah, just so I think a common fallacy that you see is most people think that having like a firewall, antivirus, uh, endpoint, all those products, we bypass them. That's easy. The best security is, is you. Like that is the best security is just learning the, like, the different techniques and tactics. Um, that is the, the ultimate level of security right there. Knowledge is power. <laughs> yeah, hi, everybody. Um, quick question. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows, but Elon just dumped Twitter. He doesn't want it anymore. <laughs> and he's also uh, developing what is called the space verse, which is huge. Um, he's, he's developing a whole bunch of work with that. Now, Considering uh, also what Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs said this year, that the metaverse is an $8 trillion business, that's just for 2020. Now, with that in mind, and those two things in mind, um, what would you three guys recommend and how much would it cost to hire you to provide security services for the development of the space verse with Elon Musk and to monitor Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and make sure everything goes smoothly and, and give, put a little protection so there's a minimal loss of money. What do you guys recommend? So definitely talk to us after this. <laughs> uh, we'll bring a calculator. With, uh, with the metaverse, um, I was chatting with a buddy of mine that I used to work with and the, the funny thing about the metaverse is take all of the things that we're talking about right now, right, of breaking into your computer, uh, you have a router with default configs, you're running an outdated browser because why would you ever update things, right? Um, there's like a million ways. And now let's take that and combine it with a virtual reality where now I can get to know you and build a personal relationship with you. And I can set up more and more and more traps. I can um, visually fish you. You'll it's, actually think that I'm a person talking to you because you will see me as a character. The, it's the, so much easier to fish someone like that than over chat. Like, trust is uh, so much easier. Ho hold on, hold on. I, you're, you're going into the metaverse development. Pardon me. I didn't make the question specific. We're, we're talking about Spaceverse, which is including the, the blockchain, crypto, NFTs, the whole nine yards. Um, now, on that note, what do you guys recommend? And if, and if let's say, uh, Elon wants to hire me as a, a, a strategist, how much would it cost for you guys to provide your services? And uh, a little input on that. Yeah, let's go to dinner. Uh, we, we could chat over dinner. Um, the, I think for starters, what we need is like, in, in the traditional Web2 security world, you have you know, the OWASP top 25, top 10, which tells you that these are the uh, top 25 common attack vectors for web applications, right? There's, there's, there's zero awareness right now. So what we need is first to create uh, uh, threat guidelines, modeling. Threat, threat model, modeling. best practices. Then we rank which ones are the most common attack vectors, the severity of them. You, you have to kind of start from top uh, and then and kind of go down from there. And build a team. I mean, a bank yeah. has probably a nice percentage of total employees are working somewhere in compliance or security. Okay, question. So you spoke about the lack of some uh, protocol development teams of basic cybersecurity practices. Like really basic, right? Oh, boy. So <laughs> what would you say that would be a good recommendation about best cybersecurity practices for Web3 companies? The same things of any Web2 company. Basically, yeah. don't think that you're different because you're Web3 because you're still relying on your underlying infrastructure and you're still coding the same way that most of the time that Web2 does. 
So take take the three, two, three decades of knowledge of Web two security best practices and all the hacks that have happened and you know how they recovered and how they fix things and how they change the way they do things. Take all that knowledge that's available um, and freely available. Actually, just you're on YouTube and you learn how to do secure coding, secure infrastructure. Yeah, it's what, all available. What you want to have is defense in depth, right? It's a very like it's been around since the '70s. Basically, you want to have multiple layers of security so that you're building up deterrence. There's no single point of failure. So that is basically like, like on a foundation level, that's where you start. Another thing I would suggest to dev teams is pull in an auditing team that, that can really demonstrate to you that they know what they're doing, um, but they also go above and beyond for you as far as helping you across the entire stack. I think that that's something that the industry is missing at the moment. Um, at Halberd, and that's something that we certainly do, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that more teams will start doing similar things as well. Yeah, especially the entire stack. Like, don't think yeah. that you did your smart contract audit that you're safe, right? Yeah. You have your everything else except your smart contract that's still an attack vector, and the people who work for you. Let's not forget, let's not forget that this was 90% of the Harmony, not the, the Axie Infinity hack, was actually because of human error, right? It was because of a person that got fished. One thing to keep in mind about developers, as an attacker, my favorite people to go after is the developer because nine out of 10 times in an organization and a developer is running with elevated privileges, yep. right? They need to run with elevated privileges so that they can build their applications. Right. So they typically have the worst OPSEC there is. You know, I don't go after, you know, the, uh, the ad, like, when, I, when, I, when I'm inside of your internal network, the first thing that I really do is I start looking for, you know, the, the developers. That's, that's like the easiest uh, attack vector there. Yes. I I, oh. Hey, um, I know you said that you could bypass a lot of these, but just for end users, I was wondering if you had any recommendations of antivirus software or firewalls um, type stuff, like anything that you, like any of the best packages out there for end users that you would recommend? I, I, I wouldn't worry about that as the end user. It's more something that the companies need to worry about because we got to take into account that the people targeting the end user usually, right, unless you're like a high value target, um, they're very different from those, these teams that are targeting the, the blockchains, the L1s themselves. Sarah is very high valued. Mm -hmm. so. Sarah is very high valued. Okay. Um, so, uh, the, what operating system are you using? Apple. Okay. Yeah, I mean... I'm using Bitdefender. Bitdefender's I mean, pretty not good. A, we're not sponsored by them. No. Yeah. Uh, ESET, not 32, uh, is a pretty solid one. You know, it, at the end of the day, those, those types of uh, products can only detect known attacks. They're not going to detect custom payloads. Yeah. Something that might be helpful would be if you're running OSX, uh, Little Snitch, right, right by yep. OpenSea, is a great application that you can run that'll show you outgoing network traffic, like beacons, uh, which could be an indicator that something fishy is going on. It'll also alert you when you open apps of like, hey, did you know that this is trying to make like a, a TCP request to this particular domain? Um, and you're like, well, that's weird. Why am I going to Russia? Right. So also, there is a bunch of free tools by Objective-C. Um, the guy who writes them, he's one of the like, best malware and like vulnerability researchers for Apple. Um, it's objective C, uh, dot com, I think, or just Google objective C. Um, yeah, S S C S C S was it S C E or S C A? He put S E E. Okay. Yeah. So objective dash S E E and they're all free and they're great. Yes, sir. Hey, um, of all the, of all the crypto that gets stolen, um, I mean, I feel like there's, there's like maybe four or maybe six, I'll just talk about like four kind of like attack surfaces, right? Like ways that people could get that crypto. I mean, one is, one would be like, uh, you know, you have, you have a past, you have, uh, you know, your words or whatever written down somewhere and someone sees those or steal those, steals those out of your safe or whatever, or they find them. And then another way would be like, um, you know, you have a password manager on your computer and then that is someone accesses that somehow. And another way would be like, 
you just lose your crypto because you didn't do either of those things or you did one of them and that one got burned somehow. It, you know, so that's like a third attack surface is just you losing the crypto. No one stole it. You just lost it because you didn't have enough copies of it. And then another one will be like, you know, uh, exchange it, like in someone hacking an exchange and then, you know, you lose your crypto that way. Or another way would be like, you have um, like the, the de all the DeFi stuff you're talking about, like where it's, you know, um, either a phishing attack or whatever just all that or stuff. you so, sign away your crypto yeah, yeah you sign it away yeah like you click on something that's wrong even though nobody got your like password like you, nobody like stole your stuff but they did because it was strict anyway so it's like what what kind of uh in terms of what level of attention to pay to all these or what are the odds like what are the odds of your crypto getting stolen in those different ways in your opinion or getting lost and then um what are as like a fraction of the total you know those five let's say and then what like what percentage of total stolen crypto like maybe your odds of getting stolen aren't that high but like a lot of the crypto that is stolen is stolen via this one way because it's they go for like a massive attack where they steal 500 million from one person as opposed to stealing like they're not going to target you through that method because you only have 500,000 or 50,000 or 5,000 so they don't care about you but they would target this one guy or whatever you know I don't know so what how uh how should we kind of uh, vary our attention level to each of these different threats, you know? I don't think any research has really, if there has been, I haven't seen research that like use quantitative metrics on something like that. Yeah. It's a great question. But I mean like, like in your kind of I would uh, say the random guess, like your, your educated guess kind of opinion as experts on this kind of stuff. Though, I know? would say your, your, the least like probability of it getting hacked from all these things is Again, like there is different exchanges, right? But if we're talking like the top tier exchanges, they have, I mean, we have Preston here who worked for Coinbase Security and they have a pretty big security team. Their team's uh, really good. Like, so Coinbase is I would like, say that's probably the lowest probability if, if it's like a big exchange getting hacked. Um, yeah. Sure. FDIC insurance, et cetera. Yeah, so the probability of you suffering from a $5 wrench attack, I would put at the bottom of the list, right? Someone breaking into your home, stealing your seed phrase. Um, granted, you should intrinsically be designing a solution for yourself that if one of those things gets compromised, one, you don't lose your whole private key. Um, you have redundancy in places. And so that's where you start getting into like multi-signature wallets, et cetera. And the threat vectors based on if you're a developer versus a normal user certainly shift uh, the probability of certain, certain things. And so, um, for example, if you're using a bank vault, right? the probability of your bank vault getting drilled is very, very low relative to you keeping a hot wallet on your 1995, you know, Lenovo and surfing the web with it. Um, and so you kind of have to, if you're using a hardware wallet and if you're using, if you're carving your key up into multiple safe places with redundancy, I think most people would be fine. Your largest threat vector at that point would become an interesting thing that hasn't happened yet that I think will happen, which is Ledger getting popped and pushing malicious firmware down. I think it's pushed to your device. Yeah, uh, but that's, but again, that's 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 that's, a, that's something like that. Again, like a nation state would need to do, right? or or just some you know so a malicious attacker coming in as an employee, right? right? And this is something that we've discussed. Um, for us to do what we do. We got the white glove, you know, like having clearances, they go through your whole life, right? They, they make sure that you are like squeaky clean. You know, like we've pen test, like Preston and I pen tested the Federal Reserve Bank. They went through our whole entire life, right? Um, so that doesn't happen right now in the crypto space. You have auditors all over the world. How do we know that those guys don't have, um, those people don't have, you know, malintent? How do we know that they're not tipping off a vulnerability that they discovered to someone else so that they can actually execute on that vulnerability? Especially when you look at like 23 year old finding a vulnerability in a protocol that I don't know, this vulnerability could be worth 150 million. I mean, that can set him and his family and his grandkids for life. Yeah, what, no one's vetted. What, yeah, what, what, like, yeah, like, no what's gonna vetted. stop him from doing that? Yeah. 
It's like juggling. It's like you, like you don't know because right, you, you, Ledger probably has like a better security team, and then you go to like a, a like a second, third tier wallet. They probably have like maybe no security team, but then you maybe have they have like attackers have less and like to benefit from get from going there, right? Uh, if, it's it, I, I don't, honestly I don't know how to answer if, this. If <laughs> I was a malicious attacker, I would go apply for Ledger and work for their team. And then you perform a supply chain attack. You push out firmware that compromises devices. You, you, know, you have a time delay of five or six months before you steal everyone's keys. Pro probably the top, right? And Lazarus has been known for doing that. The, this attack group that did Axie Infinity, I mean, all these APT groups, they've been, like, there's Chinese APT groups that have been working They've been got caught like working in Raytheon for 20 years until they stole something, right? They they have patience. They take the time and until they they like it's go day. It would be interesting to see a slight modification to firmware that modified the randomization during the seed generation process. Yeah. That basically, if you knew. If you knew that there was a flaw in how seed phrases and how random words are being chosen within the secure enclave, it's where essentially instead of making it 2,550 words to the 24th power, right, let's make those odds a little bit more in your favor. I don't have any reason to believe that that's happened yet, but it would be very, very interesting in the future. It would be very of, scary if that happened. Of using tactics like that, a very subtle, mm -hmm. and you're not going to pop those things immediately. You're going to wait. Like, I'm going to wait until you're rich. <laughs> You know, so like w w casinos often have really good security, but there was a and you know this is a well known and documented attack. There was a a person who basically their job was to develop the the firmware and the code for you know slot machines, and he put a back door in the slot in in the actual slot machine uh, code so that if you push a certain sequence of buttons at a certain time frame, the machine would just puke. It would just throw out all the coins. And he went around for months and months and just robbed casinos clean doing that. So it was... Yeah. yeah. I, I have a question about DAOs. Uh, in your work, have you guys uh, seen, obviously, many projects in this space are actually not run by centralized companies, which issue standard laptops and dictate policies and, uh, and you know, enforce them. But many are run by DAOs, which are kind of loosely organized. In your experience, have you guys seen that those are more or less vulnerable to attacks? And uh, what kind of advice do you have for DAOs specifically to better protect themselves? <laughs> uh, I, I think DAOs are a great idea. Um, In theory. I don't think that we're mature enough yet to see them done properly. We've seen it several times already of like, when the rules need to change, they change. Uh, the person that wrote the code has a lot of DAO governance power and suddenly they can kind of do this thing. Um, I do think that they're a great idea. One team that I actually really admire is Shapeshift. I think that like what Eric and his team did of, of basically saying, hey, we have this entity and we're just gonna give it away and let's let the community build it. I think it's really something to admire. Um, it comes with a lot of challenges. I've hopped in and out of their Discord a couple times over the years, and like, it's really cool to see what they're doing, but it's also, it's really difficult to get a bunch of strangers to do the things that they said, that, to show up to work, right? Like, it's really difficult, um, so. But I think in, in their case, they went from like, a cent, cent, like from a regular company, right? Which probably had some of the standards and the issued laptops. So, I mean, I, I haven't followed up, but I, I hope they kept some of, some of the, like the standards, at least the standards, of like the coding practices and things like that, that any like the companies would have to have as part of compliance and regulation. I had Again. a question. Oh, go Sorry, go ahead. I had a question over here. Uh, this is kind of more for the developers. Um, and I've been out of the game for a while, so I don't know if this is still a thing, but the OWASP top 10, is that still a thing? Is there an updated version of that? And then will, do you think we're ever gonna get something like that 
for Web3. So like, could you explain just like what the OWASP is and if, if anyone has a tech company, you know, if their devs don't know and they don't go through yearly OWASP training, they probably should. Like sure. we're PCI level one compliant and stuff like, these things should exist for Web3 as well. Absolutely. Um, we're actually best friends with two of the guys that put, up, put out the OWASP top 10. And we definitely need a similar type of uh, governing or, or best practice or guideline for blockchain. Um, and this is really, you know, this could actually be something that could be crowdsourced. Um, I would recommend that actually uh, for, for that to happen. And Preston's actually working on uh, his own little, you know, side project. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about it. Yeah, you know? basically just kind of analyzing data at scale of like, what are we seeing in the industry? I don't know if anyone's done it yet. I'm sure that they have. Like, if, if you've thought of it, a thousand people have already thought of it. Um, maybe in a, like three months, I'll have something and I'll, I'll tweet about it and see if I can find you. Um, but it, there should be standards. People are working on them. Uh, I know a lot of, I know Trail of Bits was talking, like I've, I've spoken with several other guys in the past. Um, I know Halburn's working on another thing. And so at the end of the day, it's like, it's all about getting these teams to work together for the common, like for the common good, right? So, so they are updating OWASP. It's been up, yeah, yeah, last yeah, time yeah. I saw it, it was yeah, pretty old. It it's updated. been a while. It gets updated. Like nice. the, usually they some things come out uh, and, and like the maybe like the ranking change uh, for anyone who doesn't know what the OWASP top 10 is it's basically the top 10 uh, mostly common vulnerabilities in uh, for like web, web applications yeah so web applications I have one for mobile applications uh, basically categorize they do it I think every year or every couple of years they they do this research and see like what's the most common vulnerabilities as a guideline for developers to like hey these are the most common things that get like exploited in the wild, so uh, watch out for that. And basically how to safeguard against that. And what would also be interesting would be you should actually have multiple flavors of this guide based on who is the consumer of the content. So for example, the dev probably needs to worry about very different things. There should be a, a blockchain security guidelines for end users, right? There should be one for node operators right. because the threat vectors are very, very different and the people that are targeting you will use very different tactics based on who you are and what you're doing. So, It's, uh, it's definitely something that we're, we're working together on, on building as a community, you know, absolutely. If, if you know anyone that's interested in contributing to that, we would love to work with them as well. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thank you, Luke. Well, guys, you can tell they can stay in here and do it all night, all right? So we want to thank again uh, Danny, Masan, and Preston. You can mob them all <laughs> right after the show. Thank you. Uh, next week, uh, Isaac will be back. He's in Florida right now, so shout out to Isaac. Shout, go, Isaac! And then uh, Pedro is, uh, I think, in Germany. He should be back soon, so go, Pedro! And then lastly is this, um, if you got uh, big ballers or if you got like um, new guys coming on the island, they need the concierge service. This is brought to you by Limitless Concierge. You go with Gretchen on the back and uh, she was helping out with the scan. So go to her and uh, she can help you out with that. Guys, uh, eat more, eat more, drink more. Thank you very much. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you.